It's hard to sum up what makes wrestling such an engaging art form without considering its base nature. It's theatre condensed down to its purest form. Performance, conflict, audience. And what separates it from real sporting events is that through wrestling, the narrative we want can always be given. It's a distraction from the brutality of reality. We want to see people who we can cheer for, conquer impossible odds, like we know we can't. Perhaps that explains why animals have long been entwined with theatre for the common man. We want to conquer nature, we want to have control. Also, it just looks cool, and we like to gawk at cool shit. Bears have arguably been the most effective wrestling counterparts to man, being that they're huge and sometimes stand on their hind legs. We really think that's about the level of thought that's gone into it, and we can't argue with it. So, naturally an actual man versus bear wrestling match would go about as well as a breakdown in a bagel shop. To even the odds, one must declaw and defang a bear. Often bears will also have some of their tendons cut to weaken them. But it's best not to worry about that. That's just reality. Unfortunately, reality doesn't care what we want. And thus, away from the bears, there has been significant human cost. Broken ankles, lost fingers. You really get a sense of the intelligence of people willing to wrestle bears from an injury like that. The bears would have been muzzled and missing all but their back teeth. That's an unwavering desire to act like a moron. Some of the bears have acquired a significant amount of fame. Battling Bruno, a bear beloved by Queen Victoria, was stuffed upon her request and given the title of Knight of the Royal Bath. Boxing gloves have found a permanent home on his paws and there is a metal collar around his neck kind of like Jesus with his crown of thorns, but not. It's claimed he knocked out a popular San Francisco boxer called Gentleman Jim, but when you look at footage like this, we think it's unlikely he actually did. Most bears that ever fought in boxing matches were drugged out of their minds, had severely limited mobility, and were taught over many years that to fight back meant a severe beating later in the day. Then again, a bear called Lena did kill a wrestler around this time, April 14th, 1878. The bear squeezed the man so hard he died of internal injuries. A reporter who had witnessed one of Lena's co-workers fight earlier remarked that it did not understand the fun of the thing. He didn't want to be thrown, but he exhibited no desire to throw his opponent. Weird that. It would be a push to claim that moral scruples and bear ownership go hand in hand. The life of a guy that makes money off a bear is unsurprisingly bleak a lot of the time. One of the most famous bear wrestlers of the 20th century was called Victor. His handler, Tuffy Truesdell, added him to his act to establish some significance. In 1956, the Milwaukee Sentinel caught up with him. I needed a new angle to keep alive my wrestling career. Other guys wrestled bears. I thought I would try my hand with gators. There's no pleasure mixing with gators, but it's a living. So, yeah, gators, but he switched over to trusty bears when a bout with Rodney the Wrestling Alligator resulted in him needing 40 stitches. Victor was one of those bears who got a punter's finger. A notable incident happened in September 1981, when who else but an army corporal decided to swing his dick around by stepping into the ring with a slave bear. His lawyer recalls, as the bear was licking and chewing on the fingertip, the trainer walked over, scooped up the finger, handed it to him, and said, Get out! Truesdale didn't want the bear's wrestling license taken away. That was his meal ticket. And yet, part of his act was to invite people from the audience to try to defeat Victor. A director for the Humane Society of the United States would later say that Truesdale's bear was being exploited in the most obnoxious way possible. Victor needs a drink. Oh, that, oh, ladies and gentlemen, sitting up. He's having his treat now. That's really a wonderful, wonderful act. How about that? A big hand. He really got them down in a hurry. The world isn't short of obnoxious bear owners. Just in 2010, a bear owned by a guy named Sam Mazzola killed a 24-year-old man at feeding time. 
A year prior, Mazzola had had his federal license to sell or exhibit exotic animals cancelled. I have a bunch of animal rights activist pieces of that are deciding what people can do and taking away other people's rights. For decades, he had run a business out of Ohio called World Animal Studios that promoted bear wrestling. And his story is, of course, incredibly bleak. It ended in 2011 when he was found face down on a waterbed, the seediest of all beds. He was wearing a gimp mask which had been zipped up after a sex toy had been placed in his mouth. He has uh, signs of positional asphyxia. Uh, he's found face down in a waterbed. Along with four bears, Mazzola left behind four tigers, a lion, and 20 wolves. I'm news, that's why you're here. We want to focus in on Terrible Ted, another hugely successful 20th century wrestling bear. He worked the Canadian circuit quite a bit with his handler Dave McKigney, aka Jean Dubois, aka the Bear Man. They'd often stay with the Hearts in Calgary, wrestling a lot of the Stampede roster. In his autobiography, Bret Hart remarks, at least once a year, Terrible Ted the Wrestling Bear came to town for a couple of months. Terrible Ted lived in a mesh cage under our back porch. Dean, Ellie, Georgia and I would dangle our bare feet through the slats in the porch steps and drip fudgicles on our toes for Ted to lick. If we had to lick any guy's feet, it would be the guy who orchestrated the best double turn in wrestling history. Ted spent his formative years with a traveling carnival. When that folded, McKigney took him on. Terrible Ted was one of the finer bear workers, being able to orchestrate a snapmare, a monkey flip, and sell his opponent's offense to some extent. Bobby Heenan sharing his experience of working the bear in moderately kayfabe tones. Teddy really didn't want to be there because it was winter time and he wanted to sleep. I'd get up behind Teddy and I'd kick him right in the arse and say, guess who, Teddy? I'd lock up with Teddy when he was standing and squeeze his foot twice. He would put his foot up and monkey flip me. Then I'd get up and go behind the bear and squeeze his shoulders twice and he'd reach up and flying mare me. When a young kid would come in, he'd have to wrestle Teddy for a couple of matches. We would all see that the kid was nervous. We'd reassure him and say, let the bear just play with you. After the kid would leave the dressing room, one guy would be designated to go to McDonald's and get packets of honey. We'd put the honey on our hands and slap the kid on his ass on the way out. For his part, it seems all Ted really wanted was the promise of something sweet, be it a honeyed anus, a heart foot fudgesicle, or an aftermatch coke. But we think what he'd love the most would be being allowed to hibernate. Ted's wrestling license was always in danger, being taken away and reinstated regularly. A friend of McKigney shared his experience of trying to get Ted back in the ring. I said, well, it's a simple solution. The bear man can't earn a living if he doesn't wrestle the bear. If the bear can't wrestle, then the bear man can't feed him. And if he can't feed him, he's going to shoot the bear on the city hall steps. Then I called the radio and TV stations. He made more money with the bear that year than if he had have wrestled him. Ted spent time in county jail in 1970. There was an open invitation for anyone to wrestle him with the prize of $1,500 at stake. One night, a 350 pound construction worker, who we imagine was pretty terrible in his own right, accepted the offer. McKigney immediately reneged and a legal battle ensued with Ted being held as security. The bear was eventually released on a $3,000 bail and returned to his cage at home. By 1978, Terrible Ted's wrestling days were petering out. A successor called Smokey was gradually being worked into the act and it had a lot more energy than Ted, often jumping on people for attention. During mating season of that year, the bear's cage door was left open while McKigney rushed to answer his phone. Smokey ended up mauling McKigney's girlfriend, Lynn Orsa, to death. Both Smokey and Terrible Ted were immediately seized by the Ontario Humane Society. It's not known what happened to them. McKigney's own life ended in 1988 when he attempted an emergency swerve to avoid a moose on the Trans-Canada Highway. The crash claimed Adrian Adonis's life too. Bear wrestling has largely left the public eye. 
These days, perhaps the most famous bear wrestler is Dagestani Khabib Namakhamedov, whose own story inspires young Dagestani wrestling prospects to continue the practice. It's essentially fine though because Namakhamedov's cool, it looks cool, and that's how things work. When his career begins to falter, it may look worse. For now, let's all gawk at the novelty of it all. Did you enjoy that? Let us know in the comments section. And please, like and subscribe if you want more.